Robert Adler was a very productive inventor. He received more than 50 patents in his lifetime. But only one of those patents changed an industry and modern life. Adler invented the TV remote control. <laughs> Along with the fellow engineer Eugene Polly, they not only enabled generations of couch potatoes, they've also changed the way we think, laying the foundation to this everything wireless world that we live in today. On July 97, NASA's Mars Pathfinder landed on Mars, and its capsule was covered with airbags, so it bounced off the surface of Mars, and when the dust settled, it took a selfie. <laughs> Turned out one of the airbags didn't fully deflate it, and the rover was stuck and couldn't get off the platform to roll. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so two radio commentators discussed this misfortune in a morning show, and one said how impressed he was that the NASA engineers out of Houston are manipulating the rover and the capsule on Mars. The other wasn't that depressed and said, basically, if you accept TV remote controls, it's the same, just a bit further away. So why is it that one invention changed the world and the other 50 we never heard of? So consider something you may carry in your pocket. Keyless entry system to a car. Easy to understand what it does, and all it takes is for French automaker Renault to introduce it to the market in 1983. Customers like it, other car makers think we can do that as well, and pretty soon it's in your pocket. But what if it's 1885 and your car bends and you've just created motor car model one? What do you do with that? For a world that for thousands of years relied on horses for transportation, cars are hard to digest. In fact, Carl Bunz himself, for the first couple of years, wasn't sure what to do with his invention, so he just drove it around the block and kept improving it, built model number two and model number three. Think about it, roads aren't great, there are no gas stations, and if it will break down, it will be very difficult to get help. It wasn't until his wife, Bertha, got fed up with all of his nonsense, so she took the car, took the kids, and went to see her parents, 65 miles away. <laughs> and by doing so, demonstrated to the entire world, but mainly to her husband, that his invention can be put to practical use. In 2007, I got involved in a research, along with Dr. Israel Hodesh at the University of Michigan, on technology that would tame that. Diabetes is a pretty big problem. In Northern Ireland, for instance, it's four times as common as all types of cancers combined. And it's the single largest contributor to healthcare costs. When you have diabetes, your body's ability to regulate sugars have been compromised. We regulate sugars with insulin. Sugar too high, we make more insulin. Sugar too low, less insulin. Insulin has been available as a drug for nearly 100 years. And it belongs to a very specific category of drugs. It is non-toxic. Therefore, it does not have an upper dose limitation. This means that if your sugars are too high, you can always take more. Despite that unlimited potency, most insulin users have sugar levels that are too high and are exposed to devastating diabetes complications. And this is known as an insulin paradox. Now, because the drug has been around for nearly 100 years, it's actually well known how to make it effective. You need to tailor the therapy to the individual's need. So you need to see a clinician on a weekly basis so they can make small adjustments. But that's difficult. So our idea was to automate the process of insulin adjustment. Unlike an artificial pancreas, we wanted to create an artificial physician. And we did. And it felt great because we've just solved a huge unmet clinical need and we were going to make the world a better place. So we were very excited and thought the world's going to jump all over it. But the world didn't cooperate. <laughs> and that got me curious about why certain inventions make it while others do not. So when cars became faster and roads became busier, accidents started to be an issue. 
it seems seatbelt would be wise. So Ford introduced the first seatbelt in 1945. Similar to what we use in airplanes today, it was over the waist. It had two issues with it. It wasn't particularly safe, and it was a hassle, as you needed both hands to manipulate it. So it wasn't really used. All that changed in 1959, when Niels Bolin invented the three-point seatbelt, which holds both upper body and lower body and can be latched with just one hand. The rest is history. Pretty soon it became standard, and today it's illegal not to use one. But how is it exactly that Niels was able to push his invention to every car around the world? Probably didn't hurt that he worked for Volvo. In fact, he was their chief safety engineer. It was his job to make cars safe. Adler and Pulley worked for TV maker Zenith. So they also had a vehicle to drive their invention to market. But what if it's 1880 and you're Thomas Edison and you've just invented the world's first commercial light bulb? What do you do with this? No power grid, no infrastructure to plug your light bulb into. How do you get the world to adopt such a revolutionary idea? My observation is pretty simple. Big inventions need help. They need a habitat or a fertile ground over which they can flourish. And if you want your invention to be adopted, it is your job to show the world how it is to be used. So what did Edison do? Edison built the world's first power station. He connected 59 houses in lower Manhattan to the grid and gave them light. So what does such a demonstration have to do? What are the attributes? Well, first, it has to be better, so people would look at it and want it. Second, it has to be meaningful. It's not enough to have a light bulb in your lab or a car that your wife can drive for fun. You need to show it at scale. And lastly, it has to be manageable, as you may need to refine your invention. So Edison did not connect all of Manhattan to the grid, just 59 houses. This is true today as much as it was in the 19th century. So consider cellular payment system, for example. In 2008, an industry report stated they would be very slowly to be adopted, listing the following challenges. No infrastructure, complex ecosystem, and no standards. So what did Apple do when they recently launched Apple Pay? Aligned Visa, MasterCard, and American Express to support their system, and arranged for a bunch of retail stores to be on board so you can walk in today and actually use the phone to pay. They created the ecosystem. Realizing all that, we went to look for a healthcare system to demonstrate that this can be tamed. And often you think if we go somewhere big like London or Manchester and make it there, we'll be successful. But keep in mind a successful demonstration has to be meaningful and manageable. So we ended up in Northern Ireland. Why Northern Ireland? <laughs> I asked myself the same question. <laughs> First, its healthcare system is the right size. It's large enough to be manageable, to be meaningful, and small enough to be manageable. It is also a single healthcare system, so you can start, it's broken into five trusts, you can start in one place and propagate it across the entire region. And with its uh, transforming your care framework, it's very proactive about chronic conditions such as diabetes, so much of the infrastructure we needed already existed here. It also has a government, and places like Manchester do not. So two years ago, we have started to tame diabetes at the Southeastern Trust, and we now have a few hundred people that are doing much better than they did before. We took a group of insulin users, had uncontrolled diabetes, and made their diabetes manageable while making it a smaller part of their life. So other trusts are now looking at Dan Donald and seeing something very different there. And they want that too. 
And how do you make something meaningful? Recognition. So very recently, our artificial physician won an award for the best use of technology to improve healthcare outcomes. Now, there are many awards that one can receive, but not many are given by health ministers. And when you're looking to change health systems, this kind of recognition is pretty useful because other health ministers can look at this and say, what are the Irish are doing there? <laughs> How are they taming diabetes exactly? We have that here as well. And we could not have done it in a place like Manchester. Now, this observation is not technology related, and it is not as all, at all new. It was always true. 7,000 years ago, the wheel was invented in Mesopotamia, where it very quickly went on wagons and shaped the world as we know it. But in the history of mankind, the, win, the wheel was independently invented a second time, 3,500 years ago in Mexico, where it was part of a toy. The first time Mexico saw wagons was 3,000 years later when Cortez and a bunch of Spaniards used them to roll over the Mexican Empire. The reason why the Mexican wheel never made it to a wagon in 3,000 years there were no horses in Mexico. So the next time you invent the big thing, don't stop there. Go and find your horses. Thank you. <laughs>